I'm sort of like uh, a kid in a candy shop in a country she's never been to before who doesn't actually know these varieties of candy, but wants them anyway. Um, so, uh, hi, you guys. I'll let newcomers get seated before I, before I get underway. Zach, let me know if there's anything you need that, I'm, that I should do differently, OK? Um, I, I actually am wearing a name tag because I just came from a building kickoff for the new academic classroom building in which the Department of Communication will be a, a, a co-tenant with journalism, film studies, and linguistics in the fall of 14. So there are many shiny chrome shovels down in the student union building. And for those of you at Magma Hall, um, people ask me sometimes if I'm going to miss it. And the answer is no. <laughs> um, my name is, uh, for those of you who can't read this and who I haven't met yet, my name is Lisa Henderson. And I'm very proud to call myself a chair for a couple of more months, anyway, at the Department of Communication at UMass Amherst, and to welcome you to this conversation, which is indeed what we intend. Um, as a longtime programmer of campus events and in the five colleges, Hosting a conversation is just about my favorite form. Um, people, you know, they like tennis, they like basketball, they like heavy metal, and they like academic interlocution. Um, and it really is one of my all-time favorite things. Today we're visited by a group of people who are already in conversation with each other and who have kindly offered to go public with newcomers. Newcomers to the group, that is, but in many instances experts and emerging experts on the topic. It's my pleasure to welcome Christina Dunbar Hester, uh, Assistant Professor in the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers, uh, Melissa Gregg, who is with us via Skype, who had intended to be here um, in three dimensions, but her US travel plans changed. So she is accommodating us by having gotten up at 5 o'clock in the morning in Sydney in order to start participating at 6 o'clock in the morning in Sydney. So she is here with us uh, in more than spirit, but other than body, via Skype, uh, where she is senior lecturer in gender and cultural studies at the University of Sydney. Uh, Gina Neff is associate professor of communication at the University of Washington and joins us from her sabbatical at NYU. And Tom Streeter, at the end, is a communication historian appointed to the Department of Sociology um, where he is both professor and chair at the University of Vermont, and he joins us from his sabbatical in Burlington and Florence, uh, Massachusetts, or having moved there myself recently, as I think of it, Firenze. Um, Firenze, Massachusetts. Mary, how do you say that? Firenze. Uh, I have a couple of regrets that I've been asked to please acknowledge, um, people who would otherwise be here, um, but for in some instances, emergency circumstances, in, other, in others, uh, uh, unavoidable conflicts in a very um, sort of lively set of co-occurring and timely events, um, about which I'll say something in a moment. Uh, Emily West is attending to a family emergency in the Pacific Northwest, so she sends her regrets. And Mari Castaneda, both of whom are on our faculty, is visiting Brown University this weekend with her son and high school senior Miguel Paredes, uh, Tis the Season. We're also joined, um, well, or will be joined. This is, people have to jockey this launch of the new Institute for Social and Science Research. Um, uh, hopefully joined by professors Martha Fuentes Bautista and Jaris Hansen. Uh, we are joined by Professor Dimitri Shabazz in the back room, and Jaris is coming in as, as I speak. Um, by advanced PhD candidate Zach McDowell, who is also a scholar of gaming and other uses of digital media, who very kindly, and to my immense relief as that kid in the candy store in a foreign country, um, is, has set us up technically today. Um, by almost Dr. Eve Ung, who in about a month's time will defend her dissertation on industry buy-up of independent queer media sites. Uh, and who's participating in the Five College Women's Studies Research Center Feminist Digital Humanities Initiative this year. Um, and by the newly minted Dr. Srila Sarkar, who is sitting beside Eve, who recently defended her manuscript on information and community technology training 
as development with its strengths and problems in Silampur, an area of New Delhi, India. And Srila was supervised by Paula Chakravarti, who um, is, in, uh, is at home in province this weekend. Um, we do have an embarrassment of interdisciplinary riches this afternoon, including the launch of the new Institute for Social Science Research at 3.30. So I know some people have to leave shortly. I would ask you to please toast the Institute for me. Don't quote me, but we were on the schedule first. But who's that? Um, now, I'm not a new media scholar, but as I have read Melissa Greg's work, um, book, most recent book, Works Intimacy, I expect a lot of you recognize the image on the cover here. It's an image of a woman in bed with her hand over the comforter on a keyboard. Been there, done that, am there, do that. We'll be doing that later this afternoon, or later this evening anyways. Um, so as I read Melissa's work, uh, about the penetration of work into the affective domain of intimate life, in part through mobile technologies, I recognize myself immediately as new media's subject, even if I'm not its scholar. Changing boundaries in everyday life capture most of us, oftentimes in the name of a workplace flexibility that is better understood in Greg's term as presence creep, which I think is just a genius term. And as, as chair, I, I feel like I understand it even better than I did as a professor, or at least differently, and you know, another layer um, in the in the kid bag. It turns out that we have figured we have figured out how to be in two places at once, and it turns out that institutions like and want this capacity um, from the people who work in them. Most of us don't want to be in defensive relation to our places of employment when we have the good fortune of employment in the first place. And over time, we internalize a narrative about the living virtues of technological attachment. OK, but what else? How else can we think about this? We may recognize ourselves there. That is just a, a, a non-expert's taste of something better discussed in detail by those we've gathered today. As acknowledged on our flyer, which uh, some of which are circulating on paper, they are all distinguished authors in technology, labor, gender, and various intersections among those categories. Each panelist will take about 10 to 15 minutes, then we'll offer 10 minutes or so for conversation among them, um, and then spec spend our second hour in conversation together. And I recognize a number of people from the Five College Women's Studies Research Initiative, Mary Russo from Hampshire, Ron Limbo from Amherst, perhaps others, uh, Brian Chang from our department at UMass, um, Sean Shinpak, uh, hi there, from our department at UMass, and those are some people I can name and out of a row of wonderful graduate students from the department at UMass. Um, uh, so given all who are in the room, I would say um, unbuckle your seatbelts, release your knuckles. It's going to be a very heartening ride. Thanks very much, Lisa, and thanks so much to Lisa and the Department of Communication for making this possible and <coughs> work to uh, organize this event. Um, I, I'm going to speak briefly first, and then uh, Christina will go, and then Gina, and then we'll uh, ask Melissa to uh, Skype to um, do her best to present from Australia. And then we'll have a little bit of discussion between ourselves and then open it up to the entire audience. Um, so <clears throat> the, I'm the, I actually kind of originally wanted to be on this panel not because I have something to say, but because I have unanswered questions. And it's one of the, probably dirty secrets of an aging faculty member that I can get away with that. Um, now, I recently published a book called The Net Effect, in which I looked at the rise and functioning of the vision of computing, of a vision of computing as less a rational activity than a passionate one. That is, I looked at the rise of romantic individualist constructions of computing 
um, in the history of the internet. The construction of the internet in the imagination and in a certain way in reality as something driven less by rational calculation than by Byronic self-exploration and expression. And in the book, I make the case that the presence of that romantic Byronic attitude in the business and policy making worlds in particular has become over the last couple of decades a significant feature of contemporary capitalism. And that fact also, I think, tells us some interesting things about the limits of capitalism, suggesting that in a certain sense, capitalism over time is unlivable in its own terms. Now, there's a, there, I could, I'll let that go. I know that's a, there's a lot of um, unexplained things going on there, but I'll let that go for now. And note that there was a question that kept coming up while I was working on the book that I did not fully address. I have all these tales of internet pioneers getting passionate about computing and having a shared enthusiasm for what uh, the very early internet pioneer Joseph Lickleader called, quote, the self-motivating self exhilaration that comes from interacting with a good computer. Um, isn't there a story of gender in there? Um, now, I frankly do not want to talk about sort of the present and the future today, like where things are going. Um, I think prognostic prognostication is vastly overrated in the field of internet research. Like, this is where things are going now. I mean, the pressure to answer that question is huge, but uh, it gets us into trouble. So I'm going to be stubbornly backwards looking historically. But I think we have been through a period of decades in which gender in various significant ways distinctly shaped how people interpreted the internet, how people approached the internet in its use, and how people constructed it, how the internet was built. Um, now, what I can't fully answer is exactly to what extent and how best to theorize that. Um, but to, to engage in the vulgar personal example. I know that my own masculinity, such as it is, um, was bound up with the use of an interest in computing. But I, to this day, do not fully understand why or how that is so. Um, now, so I'll, I'll, I'm going, what I'm going to lay out is a set of reflections that are intended as a way of trying to get at that question without claiming to have a full answer to it. Now, one of the things I spent some time in the book focusing on is selfhood, that is on um, the imaginary forms of understanding ourselves as selves through which we experience the world and act towards it. Um, Christina has talked about something similar in her work when she writes that the benefit of using the category of identity is to get at parts of human experience that are moving targets, slippery, constructed, yet real. They shape our lives and the material world in quite significant ways. Now, it, kind of what I'm getting at here is not that you can be anything you want or that there's, there is no self, but rather more that we often have to think of ourselves in different ways. For example, as alternately passionate, one minute, the next minute, we're an administrator thinking, as a man, thinking of ourselves as a function in a bureaucracy. Um, in one moment, we're caring parents or partners. Um, and the next, we're self-interested, rational actors in a marketplace. Um, so the contingencies of social process and history provide us a shifting set of available strategies for accomplishing the negotiation of all those different identities that everyone has to negotiate in various ways. Um, gender matters in that kind of channel flipping through identities that we all do on a regular basis. And um, so the, I think that's kind of my way into the question. Um, 
Now, how does all this work? Well, most of the people who played key roles in developing the internet inherit a tradition in which technological mastery was imagined as inherently masculine. From railroads to radio, from automobiles to VCRs, mastery of technologies has been historically treated as a sign of male prowess and control, a kind of defining trait of masculinity. Um, but of course, it's complicated. Um, cyber pundit Esther Dyson is actually a quite interesting woman. Um, has played a key role at several moments in the development of the internet. Um, but I think the most decisive thing she did, she brought to the internet, was her libertarianism. She was a key figure in promoting and making acceptable the tendency to imagine society online as made up of abstract individuals pursuing their interests in a marketplace. Um, individuals imagined as if their ethnic, gender, or class status did not matter. If none of you have ever, just this is a kind of touchstone to locate this, Esther Dyson is a kind of very sophisticated version of Ayn Rand. Um, now that libertarian model of selfhood, its allures and its limitations, played a key role in the trajectory of the internet, particularly in the 1990s, and its reception. Um, now, the libertarian's notion of individuality is proudly abstracted from history, from social differences, and from bodies. All that stuff is not supposed to matter. So for Esther Dyson, as for Anne Rand, the fact that they are women is, in theory, not central to their existence. It's, for them, a kind of background noise, I imagine. Um, now, both, I talk about various kinds of uh, individualism. I talk about romantic individualism, but also utilitarian individualism, that is the, the individual acting rationally in the marketplace. And both of those forms of individualism rely on a kind of creation from nowhere assumptions. Um, that is, new ideas, creativity, labor, emerge springs um, automatically from isolated abstract individuals. And what that does is it systematically blinds us to the collective and historical conditions underlying new ideas, new technologies, and new wealth. Now, the, if you were a reader of Wired magazine in the 1990s, you heard a lot of this stuff. Um, there was one writer for Wired who had a very different tone. Her name was Ellen Ullman. Um, I strongly recommend her work. She's a software engineer um, who's written some novels and a lot of very evocative essays. Now, she, was, she was actually one of the few writers for Wired that actually had been a serious software engineer for a matter of some decade and a half. Um, she wasn't a dabbler. Well, in one of her best essays, she talks about what she calls a male sort of loneliness that adheres in programming. A male sort of loneliness. Now she quickly goes on to point out that, to say, she continues, 15 years of programming and I finally learned to take my loneliness like a man. It's not, it's a male sort of loneliness, but it's of course not embedded in the body. It's in history and culture that produces that. Um, this is one of those constructions that's slippery but real. Um, and I think that male sort of loneliness that she's getting at in association with computers helps explain how various experiences of computing from surfing the web from a cubicle to investing in wildly expanding the stock market to maybe engaging in what Gina calls venture labor, making your own life a sort of venture investment in your own labor. Um, all those activities have occasioned uh, revivification revivification a revival of an enthusiasm for the idea of the abstracted individual in the culture and a concomitant insensitivity to social relations and inequalities, which is, you know, it's there every day in our election 
discourses. Um, the idea that individuals are just individuals, um, that we don't become individuals in history and social context. Now, the experience of computing as thrilling is something that feels like an escape and thus like a type of freedom. I think has happened more often to men than women in the United States anyway. And I suspect it's not, it's only a subset of men that sit down at the computer and feel a sense of relief, a sense of thrill, a sense of exploration. Um, but it's a widely shared experience and I think it's masculine coded even if it's not only experienced by men. Um, now, Ullman's writings are full of people alone at their computers who feverishly reach out over the wires for expression, connection, affirmation, while ignoring the people around them. That's one of her themes. Um, you reach out into the computer and there's someone offside or a situation offside that you're ignoring. Um, and so it's, she kind of, works by teasing out the inner fabrics of the experience of computing, in her case mostly about programming, um, but captures a lot of those patterns of grandiosity, obsession, and discovery intertwined with moments of missed human connection, characteristic of really, I think, the last three decades of experience in the United States on many levels. Um, so that male sort of loneliness she talks about is of a piece with the fact that our culture has imagined personal autonomy to various degree, degrees in terms of the model of the historic power of men over women, in terms of the power to command, to walk out the door, to deny the work of nurturing, and the material fact of interdependence. Um, it is this habit of understanding freedom negatively, blindly, as freedom from, from government, from interdependency, from, uh, you know, paying taxes to um, having to change someone's diapers. Um, that that helps set the conditions for the popularity of the rights-based free market for the last 30 years of American history. Um, now, I could, what, yeah, yeah this is, I should, let me uh, just wrap up. Um, there's many directions this can go, and I'm hoping maybe some of our other panelists have things to say about all this. I don't want to present this as a simple dichotomy of bad masculine identity versus good feminine identity. Um, I do think those same structures of self-understanding I've been talking about also in various ways set the conditions for a constructed sense of lack, a felt absence that can turn into a romantic longing for some unknown or unachievable other. That's one of the features of a romantic sense of self as opposed to a market acting sense of self, the sense of longing, a sense of exploration, a sense of there's some other out there. Um, and I wonder further if a feminist response to that sense of lack, to that longing, a response to this shape not by a retreat to a singular isolated construction of self, but by a sense of selves as embedded in history and social relations might be a productive political response. I'll stop there. Okay.
Yes, Tom has already touched on a number of themes. I think I will also engage um, in different ways. What I have researched and will be talking about today uh, is from a forthcoming book project, uh, which is an ethnographic study of low power FM radio activism in the US in the first decade of the 21st century, whatever we're calling that. Um, so this radio activism is interesting for a number of reasons, but I'm a scholar of activism and politics of technology, and so that's where I enter in here. Um, and this is a site where activists are purposively engaging with technology as part of a political project um, because they think that this particular communication technology and the technical and political practices that they bring to it are an extraordinarily good way to foster democratic social relations. So that's their premise and therefore why I'm interested in it. Um, to situate where this activism came from, uh, there are a number of kind of interrelated threads that, that weave through here, which include the appropriate technology movement of the 70s and 80s or so, uh, DIY and uh, do-it-yourself culture, both uh, from a sort of indie culture kind of perspective, but also from a um, sort of home improvement, self, uh, self-making of a home project. Um, a regulatory environment in the 1990s that favored heavily consolidated media, especially in the case of radio, this is really dramatic, so I don't have to tell people in this room. Um, the complicated legacy of pirate radio, uh, which people have engaged in for a number of different reasons, um, and where this regulatory environment and pirate radio kind of come together is uh, a media reform movement, which of course is not only about radio, but radio is a very salient issue in it, um, and a history of electronic tinkering that goes back, and uh, indie media and anti-globalization activism. So, that is where this sort of comes from. Um, but what I'm actually looking at is a group that formed in the 90s as a pirate broadcasting collective uh, doing micro radio, and they were raided and shut down by the FCC and turned towards um, policy and building radio stations. And that became possible in 2000 when uh, it, the FCC started granting licenses. So for a period before that, you wouldn't have been able to get a license if you wanted to do this. Um, and this slide sort of illustrates the pirate era, era which is um, so a radio transmitter mounted inside of a lunchbox, but what I want to particularly stress is the potential portability and ubiquity of this technology, and that's another reason why the activists are really interested in it. Um, okay, and so the period that I'm talking about is this early period of re-legalization, and the group is um, engaged in both policy on the one hand and a sort of hands-on technical practice on the other hand. Uh, and over the first, that first decade, about 850 new LPFM stations went on the air nationwide, and now we actually quite recently have the opportunity for up to a couple thousand more. Um, okay, so where am I? Okay, so that's preamble. Uh, what does this group actually do? Uh, this shot which I had up in the beginning would definitely show what they would claim their main work is, which is these building these radio stations. This is from Urbana, Illinois in 2005, and this is a community radio station and also community Wi-Fi network being built simultaneously, and this is uh, sort of what they would consider their main project. Um, how I think about this has to do uh, in part with, you know, what are the sort of politics of engaging with technology very, very closely? Uh, <coughs> scholars such as Julian Orr, Susan Douglas, Kristen Herring, and Sherry Turkle have all discussed work with machines as a site of identity formation, and I think that that's really, really key here. Um, I'll keep going through some slides um, to, to illustrate some of this. So this is um, one of these radio stations being built. This is the studio, clearly under construction, as you can see. Uh, and the fellow on the left is one of these Philadelphia-based activist, um, and he's wearing this 2600 sweatshirt, so that's a hacker reference. We've got some nods of recognition in the audience. Um, and, and then, you know, there's carpentry going on, setting up this audio studio. Um, 
Another illustration of this technical identity in practice is these are the t-shirts that the group wore and sold also, and this is the back of the t-shirt, and obviously it's a schematic for a radio transmitter, so, you know, really heavily on display, obviously. Um, and I, you know, definitely <coughs> observe that like radio hams and, and hackers before them, these radio activists are very much picking up this mantle of forging strong, affective, and intimate relationships with this technology, right? Um, another example is, uh, this was from a labor rally, actually. Um, uh, the, the workers who were engaged in a dispute with uh, the parent company of Taco Bell over um, tomato picking, the wages for tomato pick pickers had a rally, and the radio activists were there in solidarity. Oh, thank you much brighter now. Um, and it's a windy day and their flyers were threatened to blow off the table and so they ran to the car and grabbed a box of tools and then they're waiting down all the literature with tools and um, that was a way of sort of, I'm arguing, performing solidarity with this sort of craft and labor identity um, and it generated a lot of conversation with people. A lot of people wearing you know, pro-union t-shirts and they'd come up and pick up a brochure and also be like, you know, nice paperweights. Um, Okay, so this is operating strongly within the group, is what I'm showing. Uh, but what they're also heavily involved in is promoting this technical identity, not just internally, but to the members of the public and community groups with whom they're building radio stations and doing outreach. Uh, and where this really comes together is in what they call a radio station barn raising. And so Tom mentions uh, interdependence and collectivity they're really placing a strong emphasis on uh, sort of people helping people, skill sharing, neighbors helping people achieve something that would be very hard for them to do on their own. And so what this shot is, is um, one of these radio station barn raising events in Nashville, Tennessee in 2005. And this is volunteers learning to tune the FM antenna to the right frequency that it'll be used for in the station. And uh, what you can't see is that there are more seasoned engineers standing right outside the frame telling them how to do it. And so they're trying to get everyone to put their hands on the tools, put their hands on the technology, and you know, really promote this technical identity, this peak identity, as being very universally accessible. And I want to point out here that this technical identity or skill, or excuse me, is not the same as technical skill necessarily. They're really promoting this as accessible to anyone, and that's a somewhat different iteration of geek identity, because geek identity can also be very exclusive, and like, if you don't have the chops, you're not one of us, right? So this is different. Um, this is another shot of volunteers. Again, everyone's got their hands on the technology, and this is important materially, so this tower doesn't come crashing down and you know hurt people, but it's also really important symbolically, right? Um, okay. So, as I've illustrated, this technical identity is a sort of major plank for what they're trying to accomplish politically. They're really trying to open it up and say, if people become empowered technically, then they will have um, a concomitant sort of political awakening, and this politics of expertise is you know, going to be very democratic, and it's going to affect pretty major social transformation. That's the sort of core claim. Um, however, what I'm what I'm arguing, and again, scaffolding on others, is that using technical identity in this way uh, as a strategy to promote egalitarianism actually has pretty major unintended fallout, um, especially along the lines of gender. So coming back to this slide again, if you actually know what's going on here, these volunteers are women, you can't see them again, uh, but these the engineers guiding them are men. And so you're, because of the embedded and entrenched patterns that have formed around, say, electronics practice, you're actually, these activists are sort of entering into a situation where they're promoting this technical identity as being really egalitarian, but they're just walking blindly into a situation where, in fact, there are patterns of inclusion and exclusion around this technology that have already formed and it so happens that men have historically a lot more comfort and familiarity, and so they're having to sort of swim upstream against that. Um, 
And so I've got a few quotes I want to read. Um, and this is from an activist who's sort of reflecting on this, this project, that on the one hand, they want to use technical identity for this egalitarian purpose. And on the other hand, the traditional culture of engineering has actually been quite exclusionary. And he says, a lot of the old school dude engineers, they don't always get it. They can be standoffish, exclusive, have problems with approachability, like Jim, who's a prime example of a not approach approachable engineer. He's a fucking grump, and if he weren't such a genius, I don't think we would want him there. But it's tough, because we have to balance people who can get shit done with people who can teach. And ultimately, there are a couple of things that are beyond me technically, and so there are some more expert people I need to rely on. It's a struggle to find people who can do everything. I try really hard to get people of color and women engineers there, but I don't know that many. There just aren't that many. So he's reflecting on the fact that they've run smack into this problem where to promote their vision, uh, they're dealing with unequally distributed identification and expertise in the community at large, right? Um, however, they did have some people who they could rely on to do this. And this is a quote from a woman who's very technically skilled who volunteered for them. And she says, I've been sensitive, sensitive to the group sensitivity. They make no bones about saying, it's a dude fest, we need more women. But I feel an odd responsibility. I definitely feel like I'm extra visible, and I should be extra visible. I understand what I have to contribute. Chicks with ethernet cables, there's a certain inherent value in that, even in just seeing that, especially for people who aren't used to seeing it." End quote. So for her, having these skills makes her feel extra visible. It also makes her feel like she actually has even more to add to the activist project because she can sort of representationally, uh, you know, kind of walk the walk that they're talking all the time, right? Um, but this is a really atypical experience, actually, and in my field work, I encountered many more people who sort of earnestly and sincerely wanted to plug into this, but would just kind of hit a barrier. And as the first activist said, it's because this stuff is actually not, you know, totally straightforward. There's a lot of levels of expertise in building one of these things and having it work, and if it breaks, knowing how to fix it, right? You can't just want to learn and then magically, the next day, you actually know how. So there's a little bit of a, I argue, kind of a, a sleight of hand or feint with presenting this as really being egalitarian, because there's actually quite a high barrier to access to really learn this deeply. Um, and so I had a lot more experiences, like one example briefly is at a barn raising, this older older man came up to me and started apologizing to me and I didn't know why and then I pieced together that he thought I was someone else which was another young white woman with dark hair short dark hair whom he'd made cry earlier in the day and so I and they were trying to do a carpentry project together and she had no experience and was trying to learn but he just wanted to get it done and so eventually he kind of started barking at her and she withdrew in tears and he did eventually make contact with her and apologize, but experiences like this were not uncommon. You know, it was actually very hard to piece these things together. Um, and so in wrapping up, I think I'm at about time, uh, I wanted to point out, and I hope that this will segue nicely into Gina and Melissa's work. Um, part of the problem here, I think, is that this is a, you know, volunteeristic activity and it's very self-organized, right? There's not a lot of prescriptive structure going on here. It's like this huge task has to be accomplished over a short period of time. You know, this radio station has to go from nothing to working over a weekend. And um, because of the sort of informal self-organizing uh, structure of this, it winds up with people sort of gravitating to what they already know how to do or, you know, trying to negotiate, learning something, um, but in a sort of uh, informal and unstructured way that winds up um, with everybody, not everybody always, but it, it, again, this sort of, um, sorry, I'm losing my sentence. The, the issue I was mentioning about, um, it's earlier in the talk. Sorry, the volunteer aspect of this means that people, you know, come with familiarity or they don't. And if you're trying to learn and you're also trying to improve and sort of improve your identification uh, in this sort of self-organized way, 
that can end up with this, you know, all this fallout where you're actually kind of reinscribing the very patterns that you're trying to eliminate by saying, you know, everybody come to this and self-organize and do it yourself and it'll be great. And so that is my final point, um, sort of thinking about the politics of DIY. And thank you for your attention. Okay. The actual speaker is a little dark, but if you, if you can turn the light back on. I'm, I'm happy for lights. I, I fear that you're going to fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to talk about that stuff. Uh, wait. Oh. Great. I am Gina Neff, and I am delighted delighted, delighted to be here. And I have what is hopefully a unique problem of presenting what my book means in 10 minutes or less. <laughs> How it connects to this conversation, hopefully making that relevant, and doing so after a dear friend's 40th birthday party last night. So if I make absolutely no sense at all, I'm blaming it on her, not on, on me. Um, yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll blame Christina as well. Yeah. I will, we'll, we'll blame our Marky. It was our editor. No blame. No blame. No it's blame. all good. Sorry. Um, thanks, Lisa and Tom, for organizing this. It's great to be here. So I want us to think together for a moment about business networking. And I don't mean technical networking. I mean a room full of folks and a stack of business cards and a drink in hand. Now, if you're a graduate student and you've been to an academic conference, you've probably faced something like that. It's nerve wracking and terrible. And everyone tells you that's the way you're supposed to get a job. In my book, which I'm passing around, Venture Labor, which came out um, this year from MIT Press, um, I, I, I look at the first wave of internet companies in New York City. So these were content-oriented web companies in the height before, during, and after the dot-com boom. And I really asked questions about who worked for these companies and why, and how do we make sense of an entrepreneurial moment? Um, was it uh, everyone drank Kool-Aid and lost their mind and decided to work for risky small startups. I actually argue that we can think about the construction of a new kind of worker through this lens of what I call venture labor. I'll talk a little bit about that today, give you a little overview of the book. And then I want to segue into what that might mean for gender. So I have two sets of goals. That's the, that's First, let's think about something that one of my respondents, Sophie, said. Um, a woman who had basically bet all in on the internet company, on, on, on the internet boom. She and her husband both worked for entrepreneurial startups. They moved their family both between Silicon Alley in New York City and Silicon Valley on the West Coast. And she simply asked after the crash, how could we have been so stupid? to think that this thing, the internet, was actually going to mean something. Now, in retrospect, we understand that Sophie and all the people who were working to build the first um, online video sites, the first online advertisements, the first online social networking sites, all of these were based in New York City, um, they weren't stupid. They were pioneers. They were, they were too early for their time. Um, but they only had language to talk about the decisions they were making in terms of individualism. So I identify something I call venture labor in the book. And venture labor is my, my term for employees' investments in their companies. So I don't study founders in the book, although I have 
inter there are interviews of elders that I, that I draw on. I'm primarily looking at the folks who are investing in some way, be it psychically, <coughs> um, financially, um, in terms of deferred employment, in terms of investing hopes and dreams. They are somehow helping to build something. Um, this concept of venture labor can be uh, variable. It's along a spectrum. I, I'm not trying to identify there are people who take lots of risks and people who take no risks, but rather there is this concept that people are risk taking in new and interesting ways to study. And this venture labor is corollary, obviously, to this concept of venture capital. We need work invested into these small companies, just like companies need some money from somewhere. Um, just quickly, I did some work. Um, I did interviews, archival work, um, and I spent a lot of time studying parties um, for reasons that will become hopefully apparent in the second half of the talk. So in addition to actually <coughs> going to dot-com parties and taking field notes there, that was incredibly arduous work. I don't recommend it to graduate students who are looking to get out of graduate school quickly. Um, I also uh, did social network analysis of a database that I constructed of party attendance of 9,000 unique participants in 1,000 different events over um, a seven year period. Now, what's the punchline of the book before I talk a bit about gender? I, I identify three very distinct approaches, coherent approaches, to, to risk and uncertainty on behalf of these workers. Now, the most um, apparent one when we talk about the dot-com boom is a stereotypical and often masculine image of work that is these investments, these, this, this uh, risk taking was to yield an investment. That people worked in startups because they hoped to get rich. And they hoped to get rich off of the eventual IPO, uh, initial public offering of stock that the company would have. However, that really is only about a quarter of the people I interviewed, of the 52 people that I interviewed. Um, they were folks who were relatively late to working in um, internet companies, uh, web companies in New York. Um, they couched their terms of uncertainty, they, they talked about their work in terms of financial payoffs. So they, they used investment metaphors to talk about their labor. Um, I'm going to jump to the right, the column on the right. Um, the, the other two strategies were split between what I call a creative strategy towards risk, which I'll talk, actually talk about last, and, and what I termed an actuarial um, strategy. And in the actuarial approach, people really were um, on a spectrum of investment strategies towards their work, but they were looking more for safety. These folks felt, um, in their descriptions of their employment choices, they would talk about looking for safer jobs or trying to outsmart the market. Um, they really thought of risk and uncertainty in their work as a problem that really had a solution. And if they only worked at it hard enough, they could figure out that solution. Finally, this category of creative risks. It was actually the largest number of folks I interviewed. Now, for various reasons we can talk about in the discussion, I'm, I'm a bit, I couch a bit. I don't want to say most people in Silicon Alley had that approach for various methodological reasons. I'm happy to tell you why. But suffice to say, most of the people I interviewed wanted to make cool stuff, men and women. They were interested in projects, and they really thought that if they, if they worked making cool stuff, whatever they defined cool stuff was, then it would rub off on their careers. So if you had a portfolio of cool stuff, you could get another job. So Sophie thought. Um, so let's talk for a few minutes about the gendering of venture labor. I've laid out this, this, this model that I developed in the book about what venture labor is and how I think it's a useful concept that's applicable not just to this moment in history, but I think very um, 
a very interesting concept for reconceptualizing creative and cultural labor and labor and media industries more generally. Now let's talk about gender. So one thing, one advantage that I have of following um, the great presentations by Tom and Christina is they've already laid a lot of the groundwork for beginning to think about identity, individualism, and this sort of, well, just manic up choices that are offered in these technical spaces. Now, this is um, um, relatively provocative. These are fashion magazine shots that were actually shot in New York City uh, technology companies at the time. So this is from Glamour Magazine, 1998. Sorry, I've got it in the book. I don't have it here. Um, but you know, you see the model coming out of DoubleClick, which was one of the more successful Silicon Alley companies, um, wearing a you know fifteen hundred dollar Missoni dress. Um, you know, that's an image of a quote unquote technical worker. The look is HighTechStyle.com. Now, granted, this is a fashion magazine, but look at our male model, right? Our male model. Uh, the spiky hair, the glasses, the cool dude look. Why does this matter? Well, I, I would like to present to you today that one of the things that we can use venture labor for is to rethink what it means to be entrepreneurial. And in a moment in which um, workers, I argue, are left to their own devices, this shift, this turn to venture labor um, leaves women out. It leaves women out in a really big way. Consider Bernard Jolsovich's uh, comment from just after the dot-com crash. He says, um, to, to, to preface this, um, or the end of this quote is, it is a privilege, a privilege to be in Silicon Alley at a time when literally just going to parties shows you're still in the industry. If you keep schmoozing, something will come out of it, so go to these parties. Maybe it'll be a job, maybe it'll be an investor, a customer, <clears throat> or love. This is serious stuff we're talking about here. So what happened, I, I apologize, this is an MTV Interactive party from 1998 on the right, and it's a fuzzy picture. I just want you to see it, and then we'll, we'll bring the lights back up. So what happened at these parties? Come back to the image that I started with at the beginning of the talk. A stack of business cards, a room full of strangers, a drink in hand. This is the social networking environment that many professionals are faced with, men and women. What happens when that environment is in a bar? What happens when that environment is three programmers who run the website RussianWebGirls.com carrying large vodka bottles around as part of promoting their website? What happens when that room is literally um, a packed nightclub and one needs to try to navigate to make connections there. You can bring the lights up if you want. Um, so in, in my field notes, for those of you who do qualitative work, right, the, the challenge is, you know, you've got to be disciplined to get the things down. From the full confession, my field notes start every single note that I took from the party say, I didn't want to go, I didn't want to be there. And I kept thinking, wait a second, I run into people I know, I'm a grad student, I get free drinks. What is going on? Because time and again, I found my own intentions at these parties misconstrued. If my intentions were misconstrued, hi, I'm a graduate student, I want to talk to you about your interview. At about the fifth time, someone um, mistook that for me <coughs> trying to get something else out of him. Um, I realized I might have a problem. And I went back through my interviews with women, and every single woman said she hated going to the parties. Now, I didn't 
this wasn't temporal, uh, there wasn't a temporal connection, right? I couldn't go back to the interviews and say, no, is that because you think the guys are trying to pick you up? Or you think it's a meat market? Or you don't like them? Like, what's going on there? I didn't push that question with my interviewees. But what I can see from my own field notes, my own experience at the parties, and the statement that the women I interviewed really wanted to opt out of these events suggests strongly there's something deep so um, a couple of quotes uh, from my from um, two of my women. Um, so the first is from a very early writer, very early adopter. She had her first Silicon um, Alley job 94, 95. She had her first email account in 86 or something. She's really quite um, early adopter. And she had a baby just before the 1997-98, um, just before the New York City industry started to explode. And, and, and she said, you know, having a baby really derailed my rise because a lot of this is about going out and networking and working a lot and I just stopped. So she was able to articulate that the domestic challenges to navigating these kinds of networks really prevented, in her articulation, prevented her from having a career. The second is from a woman who um, uh, didn't have kids at the time during the dot com boom, but but also was trying to build. She she had a, a site very similar to Etsy. For those of you who know Etsy, it was kind of a if you want to think of a precursor, it was a precursor to Etsy, um, a, a, a crafting community and and. And that was a side project to the work that she was doing in corporate uh, web design for very um, top firms in Silicon Alley. And, and, and she felt her, both her, her personal site would have gotten more attention and gotten more funding, and her own work portfolio would have um, uh, been enhanced if she went out. And she said, you know, it's a performance. And I have to perform. And she talked in her interview so much about performing at work to stand up to the guys. And she really didn't want to have to do that again in her off hours. Um, so we have this image of what it means to be technical and what it means to be geeky. And in the dot com era, those images were deeply, deeply gendered, especially among these women. So, um, you know, these are three of the most powerful um, uh, women in the era of uh, dot com era. This is Courtney Pulitzer in the middle. She ran her own uh, business networking site. She's the chronicler there. The women are in their little black dresses. They've got their cocktails in hand. They were they performed a particular kind of business networking that um, certainly doesn't look like you know uncomfortable. So let me t uh, just conclude with my uh, last three points. Part of this um, talk today is coming from a, a paper that I'm writing called The Problem with Networks. And I think that, especially given where I suspect Melissa is going to go with, with her talk and, and, and the work that Tom, the, the amazing work that Tom has done in the net effect um, on, on uh, romantic individualism, that we have a sense of professional networks, both on and offline, right? What I've presented today is really the face-to-face -face business networking that happens in many professions, not just in technical ones. Um, one of the main problems I think we as scholars need to think about and address is, is that model of networked individualism really reproducing a new old boys club, right? Are we? Are we engendering um, kinds of relations and preventing kinds of access for those who can't or don't want to participate in these networks? Um, there's, there's two other, I think, big problems for us to think about in networks. Um, Sophie's comment, how could we have been so stupid? When workers deliberately are trying to build their professional networks in an industry, their, their, their social networks look more specific, not less. They get locked into that industry. So when the crash did come for these workers, their, um, their social networks were of people who were also out of jobs, right? 
it can work in regions and industries that have enough diversity. So this is one way that the Silicon Valley model works really well in Silicon Valley and it might not be reproducible in other regions. And then finally, um, I take umbrage in the book um, with uh, Richard Florida and, um, and Golly, that's, that's where the brain just went. Joop, the Warhol, the Warhol book. It'll come to me, it'll come to me and I'll blurt it out like Tourette's or something. Um, you know who that was? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Richard Florida's student wrote a book called um, the Warhol effect, the Warhol industry, it'll come to me. Anyway, there's this, so Richard Florida, a, 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 a geographer, no, no, it'll come. Um, Richard Florida has written about the creative class and the idea that creative cultural workers really build cities as they're building these networks. Uh, my challenge would be that these networks are actually work to build. They take work, they take time, they take um, being able to navigate these, um, these perhaps barriers, what some people might see as barriers. It's not all fun and games to have martini in hand and try to, try to pass out your business card. Um, so, so the reproduction of creative class actually, actually comes with it, not just a seemingly open door, but as Angela McRoby has written, um, barriers to access that may be as uh, pernicious as a nightclub's red velvet ropes. You either know how to work the door to get in, or you don't. Um, so leaving these, uh, leaving social and employment mobility to these networks may be um, uh, repro reproducing inequalities. Certainly, that's partly what I argue. Um, On that delightful note, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So I, I uh, have to apologise, obviously, that I might have muesli in my teeth at this point. Um, <laughs> can you hear? Okay. How are we going? Yeah. Um, I've been awake um, for all the talks um, to the best of my ability, and I thank everyone involved in being able to make um, this alternative presentation happen, especially Zach. So thank you, Zach. Um, I'm actually going to um, read something that I've been working on. I'll just explain a little bit. Um, I'm not, not that it really matters, but I'm not in Sydney right now. I'm in Tasmania. Um, I'm in Hobart, which is my hometown. Um, it's a very, very long way away <laughs> from where you are, um, right at the bottom of Australia. And this is going to come up in my talk. Um, but yes, I'm really, again, apologetic for not being able to be there in person. I was very much looking forward to seeing you. Um, what I'm going to present is just a brief um, set of observations that are coming out of some research I'm doing for a new um, article that is coming out in something I wanted to tell you about, um, ADA. It's a new journal that's um, attached to the FEMBOT website the FEMBOT Collective. Um, some of you have probably been contacted about this new project, but um, this paper is, is going to be part of the first issue of that journal, which is um, obviously very relevant to the gender, technology and labour questions that we're here to talk about today. So um, I'm just going to try the screen sharing thing now because um, I have a couple of pictures to show you. Um, select the screen to share. 
Is that what I want? I haven't done this before. So now I will show, not me, but my pictures. And I can't hear now, so if this isn't working, maybe Zach, you okay. might need to yeah. message me. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is a picture from um, the field work that I was doing in um, 2007 to 2009 for the book that became Works Intimacy. Um, and this is a, I think, quite evocative picture of um, a bedroom that was also um, being used as an office um, for one of the workers in my study. And i just leave it there as I start to talk about um, technology labour. Over time, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a historical overview, some broad brushstroke, brushstrokes. And I'm beginning with a very broad statement. Since the beginnings of electricity, women have been crucial to demonstrating the affordances of new technology. <coughs> this statement can be taken literally. For instance, as we recall the use of young girls to decorate light bulbs, in early demonstrations of the electric circuit, or the work women do in homes around the world every day, teaching family members how to transmit photos and messages online. In honour of this event, um, I just wanted to focus on three technologies, the telegraph, the typewriter, and the telephone. Um, and these three, I think, help us understand some of the precedents for women's technology labour today. Now, I'll just check too. Is everything okay? Can you say something to me? Yeah, if that's great. Everything's wrong? Okay, we're good. Would you prefer to have a picture of me as well, or is it okay just to have the images? I'll just go back to what I was doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, your choice. Okay, cool. So, um, the telegraph, the typewriter, and the telephone. These pioneering telecommunication devices I think set a pattern for how women's economic contributions have been downplayed, if not disregarded, throughout history. And I think um, in looking at these cases, we can identify some tropes that greet new technologies as both liberating and civilising for women. Um, at the same time, the successful use of technology by women brings a decline in material, public, or financial recognition, as we've seen in a long tradition of thinking, uh, which includes people like Braverman, Zabkoff, um, Ursula Hughes, and others. These previous studies and ideas illustrate that women have been the gatekeepers, custodians, and normalizers of new technology consistently throughout history. But when they do that work, they are poorly compensated when they appreciated at all. Even within the feminist scholarship that has been crucial to writing this article for you today, and I'm going to be drawing on a book, um, I'm assuming many of you won't know, an Australian book by Anne Moyal. This has been a really crucial reference for me, but it also, I think, typifies some of the trends others today have been talking about in terms of heroic narratives of new technology. Um, this pioneering study um, for Australian telecommunications still operates um, in a register of privileging the male who goes out to lay the cable. Um, so the bar too often moves to venerating the creators and inventors of technology rather than the composition and dissemination labour that's necessary to its implementation. So these narratives of technology design and infrastructure which triumph need constant supplementation, I think, by appraisals of the purposes to which technology is put. Just as the financial independence derived from women's use of communications technology needs to be gauged alongside less tangible values of support, sustenance and solidarity. So this article is an attempt to question the by now common sense post-feminist tenet, the alliance between female emancipation and paid work. With technology as our guide, I think we'll be able to see a little bit in the examples I show, the extent to which women's status as citizens, as professionals, 
as workers ties them to structures that bear little regard for unproductive capacities. And these, I want to stress, include the non-gender specific imperatives of community, company and care. So women's association with technology rests on stereotypes of temperament, so-called natural, innate and often maternal qualities are summoned through placing women in close proximity to enduring ideals of constancy, solace, guidance and companionship. In other contexts, these qualities stretch to include assumptions about women's organisational capacities, their apparently superior skills in logistics, or what Leopoldina Fortunati has called administrative labour. This is without mentioning the most obvious examples of women's exploitation in high tech, which rests on more explicit notions of women's dexterity, speed and docility, as in the notion of nimble fingers. In these instances, women are regarded as bodies without minds. The contrast between women's bodies and the hardware, and here you, can, you can't see my little inverted commas, hardware of tech infrastructure, creates cultural dissonance and produces perverse outcomes in patriarchy. Overprotection based on essentialism where women are seen to be too delicate to lift machinery, but not children. Or fetishes of various kinds, the pin-up girl sprawled on the car bonnet, the entire script for the film Secretary. Here I'm talking about the associations historically between women and technology as objects. One of the first PR campaigns to explicitly link technology with the female form was the insurance firm Metropolitan Life. The Lady with the Lamp campaign is described in a book I'm drawing on today, uh, Gideon Haig's book, The Office. The Lady with the Lamp campaign, he describes, drew on the mythology of Florence Nightingale. To trade on the notion of dependability and security, the light that never fails was the slogan for this campaign. So at the pinnacle of Metropolitan Life Tower, one of the most prominent early skyscrapers in downtown Manhattan, the shining light was to remind all who saw her of the kindness and halo of the angels, that is, nurses who were tending thousands of troubled homes each night. Such mythology personifies, literally incorporates, women's role as companions, the essence of reassuring qualities, ethereal visions of hope and contentment. And I want to return to this symbolic dimension of women's work shortly. But a useful place to begin an account of women's professional communication labour is the postal service. Before the development of the telegraph, female postmistresses were one of the earliest examples of economic expediency in the workplace. In Australia, where vast distances pose a challenge for reliable messaging between colonies, the decades spanning the 1860s and 70s saw women employed in high numbers due to accommodating differentials in pay. So Anne Moyer, Anne Moyer, the book that I'm quoting from, writes of the average wage for postmasters in Victoria, that's blokes, as between 150 pounds to 485 pounds a year, compared to 60 to 180 pounds for postmistresses. And we can get some of the um, mindset of governing parties of the time through records surrounding the appointment of the first Indigenous woman to the public service, also the first female postmistress in Western Australia. And here she is, this is the picture you're looking at now. Moyal notes the opinion of one superintendent of telegraphs, James Fleming, who, reflecting on the female Aboriginal, recommended to him, quote, who is perfectly familiar with the telegraph code and manipulation of the key and can read and write smartly, Nonetheless feared, quote, the lady would prove inconstant and it will be necessary to appoint someone to whom the quarters and a small salary will suffice. With the strong support of Benedictine missionary Rosendo Salvado behind her, Ellen Cooper, who is in the centre of the picture, was nonetheless offered the position of postmistress at the beginning of 1874 with an annual salary of 
30 pounds. Moyal's account, from which this picture is taken, may have been written too early to mention that Cooper actually died of tuberculosis at age 30, after two marriages and a child who died at birth. Cooper held her post for as little as three years as her illness worsened. She passed on her skills to another Indigenous woman, Sarah Ninak, although she, um, for mysterious reasons, didn't continue this post. And here I just wanted to introduce um, to the discussion um, a sense in which technology had and continues to have a civilising mission. Um, and here I'll, I'll just remind you of that um, notion of native inconstancy, which I think has um, quite an interesting set of resonances with the temperament of women that's often assumed in descriptions of their capacity. And if you think that um, this idea of civilization and work um, is far-fetched, I just wanted to introduce to you this ad for um, a typewriter which is in the brilliantly titled book, Sexy Legs and Typewriters. Um, but this ad for Smith Premier Typewriters in 1992 shows, or 1902, shows the very explicit contrast being made between um, a very forlorn looking indigenous woman and the very progressively depicted white woman using the typewriter. Okay, so now I'm just going to move to um, talk a little bit more about the, I suppose, the set of um, skills that women were encouraged to use um, and display when they were gaining employment in, in larger numbers. Um, by the late 1880s, with the opening of city telephone exchanges, women were employed um, much more favourably because of perceptions of their and I quote from the Victorian government, fair and nimble fingered operating skills. For this new profession, job requirements included, quoting from Moyal, good health, good eyesight and hearing, clear speech, a good arm reach, for the women were standing at the controls until 1890 when they were allowed to sit down, speed, a neat appearance, politeness on all occasions, self-reliance, and tact in dealing with distress. Journals of the time described the soft sighing murmur in the room and the little pouting delicate mouth of female operators who were wrestling with the pangs, groans and tempers of 100 subscribers at a time. The introduction of headphones, um, and Moyal describes how these cr cradled the head and was supported on a breastplate which weighed two pounds the complaints of girls, some of them as young as 16, working in the telephone exchanges, these complaints were put down to hysteria. That amazing catch-all category for women's complaints. <clears throat> now, the success of male telegraphists in forming unions contrasted women's lack of organisation <clears throat> to fight for better conditions, which itself reflected the assumption that these were merely temporary positions <clears throat> Excuse me. The job of telephonist became identified with women as its limited career path became clear. It was regarded as an ideal and respectable job to hold before marriage. And <clears throat> these ideas of women's respectability in employment are also pervasive in imagery promoted by the inventors of these um, technologies themselves. I'll turn to this picture shortly, but um, it was Alexander Graham Bell himself who elaborated some of these arguments most explicitly. Upon visiting Australia to see relatives in 1910, the inventor of the telephone addressed a letter to Queensland's Deputy Postmaster General with the remarks, I'm glad that I had something to do with the opening up of a new occupation for women. I do not think that any industry offers more opportunity for the advancement of women than the telephone industry. So this is an argument that would prove resilient, I think, for the best part of a century, even though public opinion of the time included medical diagnoses stating the nerve strain involved in attending telephones. 
In Australia, there was a Royal Commission of Inquiry on Postal Services in 1908 to 1910, where the condition of neurasthenia was attributed to those women whose adjustment to the pace and rhythm of paid work interfered with her obligation to the state. And here I'll just quote you um, one of the submissions from a doctor, Dr. Leshen. He says, my experience of female telephone attendants is that many of them are kept far too long at their work. The complaint a majority of them suffer from is neurasthenia or practically breakdown of the nervous system. This, in my opinion, renders them entirely unfit for the duties of motherhood. I have strongly recommended many of them to resign, and they have done so. So note in this <laughs> interesting <laughs> official um, expert opinion, it's a woman's prerogative to quit her job rather than ask for better working conditions. Despite the fact that expert mentions um, the length of time women are kept at their jobs, it is the woman's personal inadequacy to maintain her nerves that makes her responsible for um, her employment. And here, obviously, um, what you're seeing is that I'm trying to make some um, connections throughout history to the same sorts of logics that were being used by people in, in the course of interviews for the My Book Works Intimacy. Um, the extent to which women were taking responsible for keeping their bearing, the overwhelming amount of data they were needing to process is a, a clear connection there. Okay, so this um, picture that you're looking at um, on the screen now um, is one taken from the book I mentioned, Gideon Haig's The Office, um, which is uh, a wonderful book, which is about to come out in the US, and I'll be bringing copies with me <laughs> when I do arrive. Um, but this is the inventor of um, one of the typewriters that was quite popular um, early on, and Scholes um, is known for having echoed comments um, that I quoted from, from Bell in terms of remarking of the typewriter's incredibly liberating um, impact for women. He said um, before his death, I do feel that I have done something for the women who have always had to work so hard. This will enable them more easily to earn a living. So um, here are the visions of the typewriter as liberating for women from their other labours as much as um, providing independence through paid work is, I think, um, the crux of the um, dilemma I'm trying to unwind in this paper. Viewed from today's vantage point, it's only too clear that paid market participation in the workforce has not removed the additional burden of domestic labour. With time, in fact, promotions for the typewriter rested increasingly on displays of efficiency and productivity. Um, on the sheer quantity of data that could be processed. And this is in line with um, other forms of efficiency logic and scientific management that entered the workplace over the course of the century through different management innovations. And I wanted to just finally um, show you this last image to give an indication of how far we've come or not. <laughs> um, this is a... a ad that I found on eBay, but which is um, available in a various number of archives from um, newspaper strategies of the time. This is um, taken from the IBM campaign um, from around 1935, I think, um, where the promotion for electric typewriters, the increased speeds that were available through electrifying typewriters, um, and the extent to which um, women's Manicures were not upset by electric typewriters being a feature of these campaigns. Um, this is Margaret Hammer, who was um, the world champion typist, who could churn out 150 words per minute with cups of water balanced on the backs of her hands as she was um, promoting this typewriter around the country. Um, so I think it's an interesting um, connection back to some of the ideas of independence, um, but also association with the body and its capacity um, and the extent to which pride and ambition also come into this image. Um, there are other aspects of women's professional 
um, identity that I want to unpack more in this paper. But I think I should probably leave it there since I'm nervous about not being able to hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Melissa. Um, uh, I think at this point, um, I'll ask the panelists if they have comments or questions for other panelists, including you, Melissa, if uh, you can, uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. Yes, yes. okay. So, um, and uh, we'll take a few minutes for that and then open it up to the entire audience. So. Who's got a question or comment? Sure. Um, I'm, Melissa, I'm going to give you a, a moment to, to um, take more comments. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I had one delivered. Oh, yeah. oh, that's so nice. Um, it's so nice to see you, Melissa. You know, it's weird, but hi. <laughs> It's a, I think there's probably layers. I mean, you can talk about the design of the machines and the fine points and how it is still largely men. And largely men who find the social a kind of interference with the technology rather than inherent in the technology. And, and for what it's worth, I mean, uh, female computer designers and programmers will sometimes talk about this, how it's, when they're trying to, I've heard it, you know, they, they talk to undergraduate women and the computer science department is desperate to get them to sign up. And uh, uh, one of the things that female programmers will say is, it's actually a very social activity. Just think about what you're doing, you know, you're connecting people, you're figuring out ways for people to relate to one another. And, um, and so, yeah, just on the, you know, and it's, sometimes it's, there's little symptoms, um, you know, ending a process being done with the command to kill, I think that's a Unix thing. And, uh, um, but uh, more importantly, yeah, that, uh, um, a, and a kind of fetishization of the object and its, you know, power as opposed to how it well it integrates into work that people need to get done. Um, and I think uh, partly the planned obsolescence that uh, we're so used to that, you know, you just assume your phone and your laptop are gonna be obsolete in a year or two, yeah. and you're gonna have to get a new one, and that's frankly quite annoying. And also, certainly not required by the technology, it's required by an expectation that technology um, has to be the latest and the greatest. And uh, um, I think there's a different 
a different ethos about design that took into account social relations that, I mean, I wouldn't want to call it a feminine view or even a feminist view, but a, it's, it's a set of aspects of life that are historically more visible to them, more obvious to them, that, that that would lead to different technologies. Now there's, there's another kind of more abstract layer, which is what we want from the machines in the first place, which is often quite a lot. There's this kind of cycle of huge hope for the latest gadget and then frustration with it. And uh, when you don't get what you want, which maybe the, the high, the, this roller coaster of high hopes and disappointment may itself be based on a kind of odd trajectory that is established in a certain kind of masculine romantic individual to sort of uh, uh, frame. So, that's just a guess. Mm -hmm. um, I have a little back, I guess. Um, so the picture of the people holding the front bottle, the performers, that, that kind of blows my mind. Is it great? Yeah, because I'm, I'm working, I didn't have time to talk about it, but I'm working on a new project that's about um, initiatives emanating from within the <laughs> the open source and after space communities to promote diversity right in their own ranks. And just as a little sort of field note, I was somewhat flabbergasted, and maybe they got to it, I don't know, I was. I don't know, um, I was at the um, PyCon, White Pink, last spring. And it was like, uh, it's a, um, sorry, it's a Python program. work 
in it and it's working the room. So it's all, yeah, what's that? we'll talk more later, but the other thing that's very interesting to me about these spaces is there's also a very high coming out of you know, hazard communities and kind of, kind of deep countercultural kind of let your Greek flag fly in all kinds of different ways. There's also really deep non-binary gender and right. trans stuff going on in these communities. Absolutely. And so that's also part of why I was so surprised at this really, really sort of hyper And maybe the answer is back to, um, and, and, and Tom means romantic in a fire yeah. sense, not in a, not in a romance sense, but this notion of romantic individualism, yeah. right? That, that if the individual stripped is the unit of analysis in this ideology, then why should it surprise us that gender is performed in this multiplicity of individualities, right? That, that showing your uniqueness, be it hyper-femininity, hyper-masculinity, or letting your queer flag fly, your freak flag fly, um, is, is, is a, is a, uh, it's like a, having an extra line on your resume, right? It's a, it's a distinguishing factor that allows people to know who you are. So, um, um, because I'm not facile today with all of these names and I'm getting older, um, I want to say it's Jay McGonagall, uh, Jay McGonagall, the gamer, who always is in game conferences in big floppy hats, right? There's a, you know, one of the biggest women in games and game development. What does she do? She wears huge, big, you can see me from across the room, I'll be the gal in the bright purple hat, right? using gender to not only stand out, but to dovetail with this notion that you mark yourself as distinctly, uniquely individual, even though we as social scientists understand the, the, uh, what's problematic about that stance. And that's where I'd love to like, point to Melissa. Can she hear us? Melissa, can you, can you hear her? I have something to say, but would you like to jump in? Yeah, I'm, well, I have a question I've been thinking of asking um, the panel, so if this is a chance to do that, I'd like to. Um, because the thing that I was curious about all three of your presentations was um, a question of space and location for the visions um, of community or individualism um, or entrepreneurialism that are being performed in those spaces. Because um, one thing we haven't really talked about is the metrocentric dimension to these experiences. Um, I, well, I, I assumed that space was important to the visions of individualism that were being um, critical to the design of the infrastructure that Tom talks about in his work. And then in Christina's, I was really curious to know the background of the people in your DIY communities, whether they were um, from city spaces originally, whether they come, come together in DIY communities in urban places, um, and that's part of the thrill of urban life. And Gina, obviously, with the venture labour scene that you described so well, um, it's all about Silicon Alley, like it's all about being in the middle of Manhattan. So I just wonder, if um, there's something about the visions of um, tech and its, um, its, its holiest version <laughs> that requires urban space. Because obviously what I was trying to do um, in my examples was show what that looks like somewhere very remote or somewhere very um, subject to colonial power. There's, there's a lot we could talk about in terms of um, geography, I think. Well, yeah, I just, I'll just jump in and say, yes, you're absolutely right, that this is a, an urban, not a suburban um, uh, experience of venture labor. Now, I don't want to say that, that this concept of venture labor isn't applicable in um, what Joel Kotkin has called the nerdistans, right, in the, in the, the, the spaces in, wow, what a 
nurse stands, right, in the suburban enclaves of technology, right, that, that uh, but, but it's this particularly gendered um, um, instantiation of it that's urban, I think. I think, it, I, I think it's part and parcel of it, right? Um, yeah, and it's certainly not, I mean, it just, I'm gonna dovetail this into a comment that Christina's work made me think of, which was, you know, Christina, your work, you're really identifying these barriers to access, even when there are explicit attempts to change those barriers. And I think that's something that's um, so interesting to take on, because you're at once, you know, these are good intentioned folks. These are not the evil guys of tech who say girls can't play. And yet still, time and again, they bump up against institutionalized notions of gender and probably race and sexuality as well, right? So, you know, in some ways what you, you've got is a much larger story about these institutionalized structures of inequality, even in the attempts and faces of being quite progressive um, and changing them. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I see my, if I have to describe my project, that's what I'm doing. And sometimes I feel kind of like a jerk, because so here I am like criticizing activism, and it's like, you know, it seems like there are also other much bigger targets, and it is, but I, I do intend for those critiques to, on some level, be helpful, and scholars and practitioners of these things thinking about, you know, what are the sort of bigger questions and what are you, you know, sort of, what are you importing basically mm -hmm. with these progressive tensions? Um, Can I yeah, ask question in relation to Melissa's question? Melissa, can you hear me? This is Lisa. Yeah, I can hear you. to say you can't enact um, 
freakishness to, to, to help um, garner um, better employability, even though it's distasteful to us, I think. We're ambivalent. Oh, we're ambivalent. Yeah, 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 it could be like kind of complicated. Yeah. But it's, let me. Sorry. I'll be here for a Yeah, let me, yeah, no, we need to um, open it up more. I just, one quick comment, which is to refer back to Ellen Ullman, whose work you probably noticed I really love. And that um, she has, in a number of essays, where she talks about, particularly in like the 80s, early 90s, being a programmer on a corporate campus in a cubicle. Um, she says things like, you know, it was actually sort of like being a 50s housewife stuck in your suburban kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a pleasant place that was clean and you had a roof over your head and, you know, all the food you needed, but you were so isolated. And, uh, um, and she even at some points talked about, particularly in those days, but even still today, you know, you talk about computers. Taking care of a computer is kind of like taking care of an infant. You know, it's this fussy little thing that requires all this constant interaction and it never quite does exactly what you want it to do. And it's a, so there's, there's these moments and these kind of shared experiences of isolation. This maybe is a way of talking about what Melissa was talking about in terms of space. And people finding themselves in a place of isolation and then, you know, looking for ways to not to fix that space, not to change the space, not to change the conditions, but to make it into something meaningful, to make it into something that you can parlay into something else. And it's, uh, so I think, yeah, there's, there's a, um, I think that moment of being lonely at a terminal yeah. is, uh, it's still there, and I, I think people try to write it and, and use that shared moment in all kinds of different ways, but it's, it's still there, I think, somehow, kind of lingering in the background. Um, shall we open it up to the audience now? Sure. Well, I have a question for John. Um, I haven't had a chance yet to read the book, but I'm very much looking forward to it, especially now. So my question is, I mean, when you're talking about this concept of bionic uh, romanticism or individualism. I'm just wondering like how, you know, how are we to think of certain new forms of labor that are emerging from new technology, or from you know, new technology. So um, is like, you know, it seems to me like what you're saying is that in some ways these are very, I don't know if this is what you're saying, but in some ways these are very Foucauldian, you know, discourses, like in some ways when you're saying that you know, this whole promise of liberation or, or sort of this emphasis on this passion or romanticism mm -hmm. um, in some ways is sort of the self you know, almost like a self-regulation mechan mechanism for making capitalism more bearable. Um, and this sort of, you know, I think relates back to other discussions of, say, enterprise culture, for example, like, you know, following Margaret Thatcher's uh, uh, era where you know, it's, it seems like the very possibility of like dealing with capitalism is this promise of creativity or there's this promise of liberation, right? Um, and in some ways, you know, one can argue that that would be actually that's kind of deceptive because it brings forward these new forms of exploitation or, you know, these, uh, you know, these new kinds of inequalities, right? So I'm just wondering like, you know, is, is, is that where you're going or like there's this sort of, you know, this emphasis on or this acceleration of romanticism with technology gives rise to something more complicated, you know, which is, I, I don't know, new subjectivities, which are, you know, more individualistic or more creative. And I guess I'm thinking of that in my work with women um, in India, but who work with the lower end of the information economy. So women who work with, uh, you know, information technology or information technology enabled services. And uh, you know, very similar to, I was in fact reading to Melissa's presentation, like uh, the discourse of training these workers is very similar to like, say, women with typewriters, for example, right? There's emphasis on hygiene, tact, you know, mm -hmm. care work, basically. And I know that similar here in the US, like Virginia Eubanks' book, which deals with the YWCA women who are being trained mm -hmm. at the lower tier of the economy. So I don't know, like, 
I guess is a question that I am struggling with in terms of my research as well. Like, how is one, you know, because women I talk to will cite self confidence, right? I will say they're part of this economy, but at the same time, these forms of labor are pretty precarious and vulnerable and gendered in these ways. So, you know, I know this making sense. Like, how does one think of, you know, and how would you think of, you know, this is a question to all of you. Um, like, you are arguing, for example, that. You know, this is reproducing, even in sort of this upper class, you know, this reproducing inequality, right? So how, you know, when you think of it as sort of these, you know, yeah, but I mean, how do you think of them in terms of inequality? But are these the growth of, you know, new subjectivities and more interesting contested ways when it comes to gender? Or are these like, you know, just old forms of, or new forms of recycled sort of exploitation or self-regulation? Um. Well, one quick answer, that's a, that's a lot, and very interesting, and I think that's that's absolutely crucial to, that's, that's fascinating to bring in um, to dissertation topic, right, on uh, um, Indian women in the information industries. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, um, first, the, I think it certainly can serve as simply a justification mm -hmm. of capitalism. Mm -hmm. I think the mistake would be to assume it has to. I think there's a there's a tendency to fall into a kind of uh, functionalist tautology about these sorts of things, where you just have a closed circle, where if something looks like it might support conventional capitalist hierarchies, um, and you see conventional capitalist hierarchies in society, therefore that's what it does. And I think, you know, one of the great advantages of cultural theory and cultural the practices of cultural studies is that if we do it right, it should teach us to listen very, very carefully for both those moments in which something might be being pulled back or being in the service of something, but where there might be other possibilities there. And so one of the things I'm quite interested in in, uh, um, in that effect, I kind of had to face it, was the, that romanticism enabled, even in its worst moments, in, like it's Wired Magazine, 1993, neoliberal, the height of a kind of neoliberal resurgence in Wired Magazine. You know, there were people, there were all kinds of things happening in that magazine that, and you'd see businessmen flipping through Wired, you know, looking for the next greatest thing and being exposed to stuff they're never going to hear in Fortune or in uh, Business Week or traditional American business magazines. Um, so there's a kind of iconoclism, a kind of skepticism about received truths in Romanticism. And that's, that's actually, you know, the, the Romantic tradition gave us the concept of culture. And so cultural studies actually has some indebtedness to it. But uh, um, it, uh, it, there's, there's, there's certain moments that you can look at carefully, and I would imagine this might be the case for the, um, the people in your study, that uh, um, where you have to kind of say, oh, this could go a number of different ways, or this, this has a, a number of different valences. I mean, it's, you know, Stuart Hall talked about articulation, or uh, um, you know, if you want to be Weberian, you can talk about elective affinity, where things kind of seem to fit together, but they don't have to. So um, that's 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 one way I try to deal with it. Um, just in terms of the, the subject that you guys are talking about, I think this might be relevant. Which is, I found in questions of gender because I, I I still feel not as well versed in the feminist literature as I should be, and you know, talking about these things and talking about it as a man is a bit of a it's necessary, but it's. It's a bit of a trick. And uh, um, there's a lot of moments where I've talked to women, you know, in the Dean campaign where I did a book about that and some other things where they'll say, oh, yeah, this is this incredibly sexist situation. And I'll say, well, that's interesting. Why don't you write about that? And they say, no, 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 no. I can't go into that particular space. And I think it's, you know, you don't want to, what is it? You don't want to come across as whining. And you may have, a, you, a person, a woman may have kind of complicated feelings and allegiances and would not want to come across as too weak. Tom. No. Uh, dog bites man. Seriously. Dog yeah. bites man. 
The technology industry is sexist. There's not a book in that. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there's a book in that? Well, there's, no, there's a question in it. And is is it, there? I mean, that, I mean, I mean, I, and I'm being a bit facetious, a little bit of a devil's advocate right at the end of our time, but, um, you know, you're right. There should be more work. I think the kind of work that Christine's doing is actually getting at that question in a really interesting yeah, way, right? Yeah, I would agree with that. And the interesting way is, you know, man bites dog. The headline story is, here's an example where despite all the best intentions, we still have the reproduction of any of gender inequality. So that's a little more interesting, I think, than let's, let's take on the problem of full force. Um, yeah. Okay, oh. now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to that because one of the things that characterizes your papers and your work in general um, is that there's such a great vision of people doing things. You know, it's not boxes, mm. it's not nuts and bolts, it's not invention. It's it, these incredibly complicated, messy social worlds that have inadequate languages that describe themselves, that have weird rituals that people get on board even before they realize what they're up to. And so the question of, you know, what, what about women's ambivalences about speaking to the sexism that they discover in these technical universes, in these technological universes, or their articulated financial ones strikes me as kind of unanswered by the, the, the obvious truth that if you go back to the people doing things vision of sexuality, of sexuality, I would, of technology, um, then there are a lot of unanswered yeah. questions. You know, and that's what enables Christina's sort of discovery of well-meaning um, tech guides you know, and their impatience with precisely the women they're there to enfranchise. Um, technology is not the only domain of that, mm -hmm. you know, by a long shot. Um, okay. So it's it's not a it's not a foregone conclusion. Mechanic, uh -huh. <laughs> mechanic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at electricity, the imagery of the yeah. The mechanics is also a bit of a woman. It, it's gender too. Mm -hmm. um, are there questions in the back? Or the high? Jane, Yeah, so yes, I have a question. It mm -hmm. would be um, with Christina, but it, it, we can also open it. I have to speak loud to the panel. So I was wondering if um, you have any idea or um, example on how to break away from um, this dual core, okay, your mom call it, mm -hmm. a culture that is recreating gender and race and other inequalities, even within um, activist circles. And um, what what we've um, noticed often in, in these activist spaces is that the, the burden of, of education um, is going on those who are living these oppressions. And sometimes these people that are doing the education are demonized for doing it, and 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 so uh, I'm 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 wondering if you have any ideas on yeah, how to address that. Uh, tough, tough question, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think well, this is not really going to help. But part of the, the sort of earlier conversation, I don't know exactly who it started it. But the sort of thread about, and you mentioned for the Eubanks work, and this is more in the, on the second project of programming in hackerspace. I mean, partly I question whether these diversity initiatives are, on the one hand, just configuring without changing the conditions of like capitalist exploitation or something. They're really just configuring more people to enter into these. Uh, you know, um, you know, system of relations where they're, you know, maybe they have these tech skills, but they're just still workers and they're just precarious and they're, you know, now they can do it in this other domain or something. And then on the other, so I partly question, sometimes I, in 
most cynical moments, I'm like, is that really the project of these hacker spaces or you know, diversity and interdisciplinary software? But, I mean, of course, it's, it's not in the you know, articulations of the people doing this, but I wonder cynically. But then on the other hand, I wonder how much this is just a sort of reproduction of privilege, actually, and especially some of the conversations about you know, very um, various initiatives um, about gender and opening up gender binary and all these things. I mean, so that seems, on one hand, incredibly necessary, but on the other hand, it's at the expense of talking, again, kind of about issues of class or race, and it's not taking into account that this is actually a better privileged community in some ways, right? Um, and I've been talking about this with a friend, but maybe this is a roundabout way of answering your question, who works on um, ethnography of middle schools geared towards new media. And again, it's kind of a similar story to what I do. It's just like this school, over the course of a year, purged all the kids of color from less privileged economic backgrounds because of all these reasons. I mean, I think part of the problem is we don't have a good language anymore to talk about class. Even academics aren't, you know? Uh, and so, again, I'm not blaming the actors per se, but like it's absent in their language because it's absent in our culture in a lot of ways. And um, you know, obviously that's not true in like radical activist circles, but on the other hand, some of the lifestyle politics going on in radical activist circles may obscure some of these structural problems. That's a, like, I don't know. Well, it's comes to the language, yeah. in, a, in a language and ideology of extreme meritocracy within technology, right? That, that that if you if you have the skill, you are deserving, and without questioning the reproduction of skill, right? Not without without ever beginning to question the reproduction of that labor, um, and 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 those investments, right? Those cultural capital, human capital, social capital investments that absolutely are dovetailed with privilege. I mean, they're they're inextricable. But it's the, the need for skill, I know a lot of women for whom high tech or you know really complicated uh, careers, that's that's an enormous opportunity for them, for particularly in the older generation, um, where that was the only way out. Like if you if you were going to go into banking or advertising in 1960, forget it, as a woman, um, because it your status as a woman just kind of was the main thing in the room. Whereas you know, when you went into computer programming about 1962, and it was hugely liberating to her because she could do it. And that was what mattered. And so that that the, the meritocratic thing, I mean, it's one of those that in different contexts can play in different ways. Um, I hope this doesn't turn into one of those rambling questions that isn't a question. Um, but I was thinking about how to, it seems to me that, and I haven't read any of your books, so I apologize in advance if um, how I receive your presentations might be a bit of an focus presentation, but it seems that in sort of critiquing various of the discourses of technological, um, of, of, you know, techno-optimism, um, that you're, all of you are very focused on the material outcomes of whatever you're focusing on, so that you're looking at how, um, when people have particular intentions, for example, mm. as well, particular intentions to democratize technology, uh, knowledge, and practice, in fact, what happens, despite what they say they'll do, what they intend to do, is X. Um, and okay, so I have sort of two thoughts that aren't quite questions. One is, um, to what extent though does it still matter that those are demo discourses of democracy, that that is the intention versus what you call the sort of evil guys that say women can't or girls can't do computing. Um, and the other is, uh, you know, in my own research, I sat on, on the mainstreaming of Queer media, I started with a much more, I think, I started from a more positive, more optimistic place of thinking that what I would observe would be uh, a 
the diversity of content despite the commercialization or the uh, purchases of independent media by corporations. And to a certain extent, I have to say, hmm, that hasn't really happened you know, over four years. Um, and yet, I don't want to say that that therefore means that the various uh, kinds of uh, practices and the various kinds of media that were produced by sites that may no longer exist, that those uh, moments, those or longer moments, years of uh, uh, production don't matter. So is there somewhere in whatever all of you discuss where you say, despite the fact that that woman ended up crying because this guy was very impatient, that maybe, okay, she cried that day, but then the next week she could do it, you know, and that she takes that you observe these moments and perhaps in your film notes and your book you describe a more complex trajectory for those women, that they take those skills elsewhere that we can't see and there are different kind of outcomes that aren't just, I don't want to say that you said it's justice, but that aren't as, as um, somber as it seems this panel has <laughs> been going. I have, plenty, I have yeah. plenty to say too, and I have plenty to say actually specific to your project. Um, but uh, maybe oh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's we're kind of getting low on time, and because uh, Melissa won't be able to kind of mingle with the crowd once things start to break up. Maybe, Melissa, do you have anything in, in, that you'd like to say at this point? or? Either question or comment. Um, well, just a quick response to that last question, which um, I thought was fascinating um, because it, it was sort of forcing us to think carefully about our theory of democracy. <laughs> um, what does that look like? And I think we need to remember that theories of democracy are themselves part of the structural condition for answering these questions. When that theory was first seemed to be a good thing. <laughs> it was a time when women's voices in the public sphere weren't present. So um, one thing I wonder and hope will come out of these sorts of conversations is if we can have more interchange between feminist theories of politics, queer theories of politics, that actually inform the structures and imaginaries for what we want participation to look like. When I was Listening to your question, I was thinking about um, Lauren Bellant's work where she talks about women's um, disappointment um, as the defining um, experience of politics for them, public sphere politics. And I just think that there is so much emphasis on voice and self-broadcasting in online technologies and platforms as they're designed today, that it's not doing very much to address um, those subjectivities and those voices that already feel tired, worn out, drained, and as I said, um, disappointed. So why would you want to project those sorts of messages um, if the imperative is to be positive and performative? So that's just um, a bit of a riff off what you had me thinking. Thank you. No, no, it maybe it's just, uh, you know, it's related to the question. And uh, uh, I wonder, uh, you know, in your work, uh, for instance, Christina said, has looked, you know, worked with the uh, activist community so closely. In the case of, you know, thinking about the spaces for participation, direct, of women in particular, I mean, the case of the outliers, the case of women who make it kind of to these governance structures of uh, activism, Correct. Uh, if you if you find things that, about their trajectories um, that we can reflect on in terms of you know how they got there with the scars, you know, with the problems, with the challenges, because I feel that one of the things is you know these attempts of these uh, I see these attempts of diversifying the crowd um, and is yeah a, a nice nod to recognition but not really to representation within the community. Correct. I mean in terms of what they do, kind of a, if you think about the stratification of labor within the activist community, 
the right gets. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of, uh, I, you know, no, we are not far from Princeton Russell Mass, that is a, a community that has their own uh, cable uh, channel, they have their own um, broadband, it's a community broadband, and it's run by two women. Correct? And uh, I, I look at this example thinking like, uh, what was the trajectory? But the kind of sometimes narrative that they come up with is, is uh, very different, you know, if you go to talk about kind of uh, community broadband with the guys, correct? They, uh, they, I'm just curious to see what you find with women who really can break the, the pattern. Jumped in. A uh, few things to say. I mean, these are all really, really great and stimulating questions. Um, and as an ethnographer, it's always really hard for me to generalize and talk up here. So I can give some very kind of grounded, granular observations. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think is arguably possibly happening that relates to both of your questions is that the gender piece of this, there's at least some success. You know, some women are becoming enfranchised and empowered and taking on leadership roles and, and whatnot. Um, and willing to be, as, as Sophie brought up, you know, take on the extra burden of educating people and being visible and all these things, you know, and that's politically okay with them because it's part of a broader vision. Um, but one place where this model like utterly, utterly failed that I have a paper about is, and this also actually relates to Melissa's question about urban and metropolitan spaces. Um, so one of the sort of vicissitudes of how LPFM was licensed was that uh, there was only space on the dial for them in primarily rural areas. So up until now, all the new stations that were being built pretty much were in suburban and exurban and rural communities. And so this is an urban group that's traveling exclusively into rural communities and doing this farm raising model, which arguably rural communities, there's uh, like that catches and there's a vocabulary there for it. Um, but they didn't want to totally lose their claim to urban organizing and so they made a foray into community wireless because that was happening in more densely populated areas for obvious technical reasons. Um, but one place where this barn raising model basically completely failed was in trying to take it into a economically depressed neighborhood uh, primarily composed of people of color in Chicago, because all of a sudden you get these politics of like, let's build farm raising and let's bring out all the community members, let's bring out all the outside volunteers. Uh, and what this arguably looks like is a bunch of white people who don't live in the neighborhood or even in the city coming in from out elsewhere, making infrastructural improvements that are possibly not even for the benefit of the residents, because then it's like we have a great Know, broadband network, maybe people want to gentrify this neighborhood or something, and so it totally broke down in, in that setting. And so even when the gender piece was succeeding, it seems like there just wasn't as far to go in some places with people who, again, had similar class and ethnic and educational attainment backgrounds as the activists, but when you're trying to import this into communities that have been more heavily disenfranchised and marginalized, it gets even harder, right? And so, again, I think thinking of the ways these things intersect and play out together is really important. But again, this is one idiosyncratic example. But it's definitely not the case that people are only, I also have, speaking of the question about tears, lots of examples of people who were like, this, this pissed me off in the moment, but then I went and built it by myself, and built it with only other women, or whatever, and that is going on too. But, yeah, so thank you. I have much more to say, but also, thanks. <laughs> Um, well, we, we can stay in the room, but I want to give people a chance, perhaps if you need to leave a chance to leave, or we can wrap it up here. And I want to be careful about um, Melissa and, and a proper farewell uh, when we close the studio. Are there other yes, speaking of broadband. <laughs>
I mean, last week was uh, out of Lovelace Day, um, which is probably why that journal's called that, right? Yeah. I'm yes. assuming. So that was the 16th of October. Today is open access week. And um, um, uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, because then I couldn't have been here, um, uh, yesterday was the Wikipedia Loves Libraries Edit-a-thon, where we were uh, uh, specifically working on countering systemic bias. And unfortunately, Laura's not here. Oh. Um, uh, Laura Quilter, who is our uh, new um, uh, librarian, uh, who is working on a lot of those issues. And uh, one of the things that uh, we, we were working on, and one of the things that's come up in the Wikipedia community is obviously you know, 87% men who are, and it's, you know, they, don't even, they don't even survey um, race, and <laughs> they're just looking at, you know, just, just alone, just men and women. They're not even including kind of, you know, other gender. And what, but within the community, they realize that there is a huge need for this. And they're putting many kind of goals in place, and they're working very hard. And I was thinking, you know, although, yeah, it's a really long, long road, and uh, we're, we're trying to, you know, get more articles about feminist scholars rather than Pokemon um, and technology ideas. But what are some of kind of, I mean, like, there are, there are some kind of glimmering hopes out there, right, to kind of counter, which what I would call, again, in technology studies, at, at, in all technology field, not just in Wikipedia, a systemic bias, right? Because if, if the experts out there are mostly men, and you need people to teach and kind of interact, like, you know, we've got to start somewhere. So could you share some other glimmering kind of hopes? Absolutely. So um, <laughs> there is a huge girls' code movement yep. that is awesome and great and deserves our support. I um, am going to give a glimmering hope from anecdote, which was I was privileged to have uh, Joanne Wilson at, um, at an event for my book in New York. And Joanne is married to someone who's, who's actually quite central in, in the book. He, Fred Wilson was and continues to be one of the most important venture capitalists in New York Silicon Alley, New York Tech Circle. But Joanne has taken on the role of angel investor in her own right and manages her own portfolio. And 85% of the companies that she funds are women owned. And she runs, um, she, she's on, on Twitter at the Gotham Gal, <coughs> at the Gotham Gal. And she runs a very important women entrepreneurship conference. Now, again, you know, we can talk about varieties of privilege and varieties of interventions. But to have um, highly visible people saying, we're going to address the number of companies and the kinds of things that people are making and the kinds of things people are doing by literally putting capital in people's hands to get it built and get it made. Um, to me, that's kind of exciting. Even though we had a much bigger conversation about venture labor in those contexts, right? So she pointed out that. Um, statistics I didn't know about women's entrepreneurship, women tend to found companies later. They look very different from men entrepreneurs, both within technology sector and, and, and more generally. Um, and they also tend to be capital, they also tend to be cash flow driven. So women build businesses that make money and then they go out and seek investment. So, um, so you know, we need to change our, our models of what it means to be um, technical and what it means to be entrepreneurial to include a whole <coughs> a, a array of kinds of, of subjectivities. Okay, shall we um, wrap up the formal part now? And, uh, um, and this is an ongoing conversation, obviously. And I think we have to thank Melissa. Um, okay. yeah. Thanks so much for <laughs> presentation and um, for the rest of us I think we'll kind of dawdle around in the room for a while and maybe talk a little more but uh, um, thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>